Amen. All right. Good morning and welcome to all of you. If you have a Bible, I'm going to ask that you take those out, turn those on. Joshua, which is one of the uh, Old Testament books, Joshua chapter 3, verse number 5. Now, it's going to take us just a minute before we can get there because we want to set up uh, what's going to happen over the next two weeks. This morning, uh, I have the privilege of sharing the first part of a two-part series uh, that Pastor Chris and I are working on, and really it's something that both of us are very passionate about, so passionate, again, that I'm going to share this week, so I'll have a little longer introduction so that next week uh, he can just pick up and run. By the way, I've heard next week's message is a lot better than this week's message, so you're definitely going to want to come back, all right? Uh, but what we want to share with you is this entire thought of what does it look like to pass your faith from one generation to the next generation. And I would just tell you for sharing in me, I mean, really, this has been our life's passion of doing ministry together for over 30 years. Really, it's our marriage mission statement. Now, many of you uh, may have a mission statement for your office. You may have one for your business. Possibly, you even have a mission statement for your life. And, and I would just ask you to tap in, like, do you have a mission statement for your marriage, for your family? And for us, it's to live our lives of faith in Jesus in such a way for us, our boys, our three sons, and then for the next generation, but especially for those living in South Tampa, that they would see that God is real and to chase after Christ. I mean, for us, what we would love to see is not only do they hear that from us, but they see that in us, that they see that our faith is sincere, that it is special to us because we want them to know that there's a God that loves them. There's a God that has a plan and a purpose for their life and that God cares about everything in their life. It was so great to hear Lance describe that even during worship today that God not only cares about your eternity and we are convinced uh, through the teaching and the reading of the scripture that this isn't it. Like this isn't all that God has designed us for, that there is an eternity that God would love for us to spend with him, but there is a choice that we make of where we're going to spend that. And so, yes, God cares about your eternity, that Jesus died on a cross for you so that you could experience salvation in him, that you would not just have eternity in heaven one day, but that you could have an abundance abundant life on this day. So yes, he cares about your eternity, but he also cares about your schedule today. He cares about what's going to happen on Monday. And so our life passion is to live our lives as a couple in such a way that others see that our faith is real. Now, they may not necessarily have put their faith in our faith, in the faith of our Lord, but they go, hey, at least for them, it's real. And so we just want to impact uh, generations to come. Uh, to follow after Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Many of you have heard this verse before, but Paul writes this. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Now, for some, that may be like, that's pretty arrogant. Wow, like uh, that's not very humble to, to say that. And I would say, yes, if you disconnect the first part from the second part, Absolutely, but remember the second part. So be imitators of me, Paul says, because I'm desiring to imitate Christ. So Paul was saying, even to those of you who put your hope and faith in Christ, for us to be imitators of Christ, therefore those who are following us, really they're not following us. Those that are looking up to you, they're really not looking up to you. They're following and looking up to the Christ that's in you through the power of the Spirit. So I, I think all of us, 
uh, have been called to live this type of life. And yet, many of you would go, wait, like, I, I don't know if I can do this. Like, I don't know uh, if I could live my life in such a way that it would be worthy of imitation. And yet, I would tell you, I, I understand in your own strength, right, that no, but in the strength of the Spirit of God that dwells inside of you, yes. Galatians 2.20 says this, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So the whole purpose of our lives and uh, to live day in, day out is, can be summarized in this initial invitation from Jesus. And here's what Jesus said, Matthew 4, 19. Come, follow me. That's the invitation. It's for you and I to follow after Christ, to allow him to take the lead. Sharon and I had the privilege of being at a wedding yesterday, and uh, it was a beautiful ceremony. Uh, matter of fact, uh, uh, missionaries that we helped support. Their uh, daughter was married, and it came time for that magical moment where the uh, the, the uh, uh, father of the bride gets to share that dance. And, and as they looked at each other, uh, the bride said, "This, Dad." Just take my lead. And I thought, man, well, that's a beautiful picture of what you and I do in this dance with the Lord. Jesus takes the lead, and we simply follow. So the question then becomes this. If others were imitating you, would they be imitating Jesus? Would their thoughts be honoring to him, their desires honoring to him? Would their words and their actions and their lifestyle be honoring to Jesus as you lead them in following after the Lord? And the reality is this. As a disciple maker, Jesus has called all of us to do that. That we are to show other people what it means to follow after Jesus, to be one of his disciples. And again, you and I have this amazing opportunity to live our lives not only worthy of the gospel, but to live our lives worthy of imitation. You know, they say the greatest form of flattery is what? imitation, right? Um, and so you and I have this incredible ability to live our life modeled from the greatest life that was ever lived, the, Jesus's life, who ultimately gave his life for you and I. And so that is the, the challenge before us over the next couple of weeks. How do you and I live our life in such a way that if others were following us, they would be led to the Savior of the world, to Jesus. How, how, what's that going to look like for you and I to pass our faith on to those who are going to come behind us? So today, Joshua chapter 3, verse 5. It's one of my favorite verses in all of the Old Testament. Matter of fact, uh, I'm not sure if you memorize verses. I would really encourage you to do so. Uh, you could start with Joshua 3.5. Many of you highlight in your Bible. You underline things in your Bible. Man, this is a great highlight, underline verse, verse. Joshua 3.5. I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we uh, read from... God's holy word, the scripture. Joshua 3, 5. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves. Like, what is that? Lay down your lives before the Lord. To set your lives apart from the things of this world. To completely, totally surrender to God. Here's why. Because the Lord will do wonders among you tomorrow. Like, prepare yourself today for what God wants to do the next day. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful that we can gather in this house 
Uh, Lord, worshiping you, singing to you, singing about you, uh, serving and giving. And God, now the, the reading of your word and the studying of your word. So God, we pray that your spirit would take your scripture and God, just make it new to us. Lord, that it would encourage us and yet challenge us. God, comfort us and yet call us. Lord, we know that you desire that we live for you and that we help others who are following us live for you. And so, Lord, help us to be imitators of you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Joshua 3, 5, I remember reading that when I was in college. Now, i got to tell you, uh, I had started this uh, track of reading through the Bible a couple of times. And uh, my junior year of high school that summer, going into my senior year, I believe I got Genesis and part of Exodus, and I bowed out. Uh, and then after my senior year of high school, uh, I got Genesis. I read all Genesis, read all of Exodus, and I'm thinking, this is going to be the year. And then I hit Leviticus. Now, I love now the book of Leviticus. It is a great book. Uh, but as a, uh, a, a someone who had just graduated from uh, high school, Leviticus didn't really, uh, it just didn't do it for me. So I stopped my Bible reading. But then in college... I was like, man, this is going to be the year. I'm going to read through the Bible. And of course, Genesis was there, and it was great. And then Exodus, my old friend, I remembered all those stories. And then Leviticus. I was like, I am going to read through Leviticus. And it was amazing. And I made it to Joshua. And I read Joshua 3, 5. And I thought to myself, like, I want to see God do wonders like, I don't want him to see just him do wonders tomorrow. Like, I would love to see God do wonders even amongst me today. I mean, don't you? Don't you want to see God do like supernatural, wonderful works in your life, through your life, and around your life? And I'm just going to tell you, that's why. If you're new to STF or maybe you don't know a lot about us, that's why one of our greatest passions is to see every generation, that generation, this generation, and the next generation consecrate themselves that we as a multi-generational church can reach people with the gospel because that's the only message we have. Good news, it's the gospel, the message of Jesus that he loves you and died for you, that we can raise people up in God's word. Again, not in our teachings or in our thoughts or opinions, but like what does the Bible actually say about this? So we want to raise them up in God's word and then to release people for you to go and do the ministry that God's assigned you, that God has called you, that God has placed on your life, and that it will transform neighborhoods and, yes, even the nations for God's kingdom. That's our passion. Like If you want to know who we are, like that's us. Our purpose is for that, to help every generation. Find and follow Jesus, but we're going to be very transparent with you, uh, but especially the next generation. Like We want to make sure, and you're going to see in just a minute why, it is so important that we hand our faith off to the next generation. So we want to come alongside them. Uh, we want to help them stand against the peer pressure that they face. And yes, every generation faces peer pressure. Uh, but I don't think any of us of my generation or older had peer pressure in their hand 24-7. I just don't think that was the days in which we live. And therefore, I do believe it is much more difficult. And of all the things that our culture brings against them, I mean, Pastor David addressed this earlier, but most of you saw what happened in the opening scenes of the Olympics. And it's interesting, right? That culture attacks only Christianity. Uh, if that had been Islam or if that had been Buddha or Hinduism, I mean, can you imagine the revolt that we would have had? But also understanding that when the Lord had this supper, this meal, even with his disciples, he knew that in just a few moments, one of them would betray him. He knew that in just a few moments... 
one of them would deny him not, not once, not twice, three times even. You know, the beautiful thing of the Lord's Supper is it is an invitation to anyone to come and receive grace and forgiveness and to live in a relationship with a God that loves you more than the universe in and of itself. Now, I know because we've heard from a lot of you that you're boycotting the Olympics and you're never going to watch, you know, again. And here's what I would tell you. Uh, that's not the athletes. Uh, trust me, they didn't have a vote in that. Uh, matter of fact, if you want to be encouraged, uh, we often talk about uh, the Bible app, the verse of the day. Uh, for the next 12 to 15 days, they're having different Olympic athletes share the verse of the day and share their story. And I promise you, uh, you'll be encouraged by that. But that's why we want to invest so much. Uh, that's why we want to do so much for our kids' ministry and our student ministry, our young adult ministry even, because we want to impact the next generation. I've shared this a couple of times. We don't want to just influence them. And a lot of you are influencers. Uh, some of you do that in your circle of friends. Some of you do that in our community. Some of you do that on social media. I mean, you are an influencer. And we don't want to just influence a generation. We want to impact a generation because we're convinced that there is a generation rising up that can change the world, that they can change the temperature in the room. So now what I want us to do is take a look at another Old Testament verse. Um, it's a short verse, but I'm going to tell you this. Uh, it's really a disturbing verse. I, I would go as far as to say this. It, it, it's probably the scariest verse in all of the Bible. Now, many of you are going, oh, we're going to Revelation today. It's not found in Revelation. It's not found in Ezekiel. It's not even found in Daniel. It's found in the book of Judges. Now, you have to understand that an Old Testament judge was different than what we have judges in America today. But I want you to look at on the screens or in your Bible, uh, Judges chapter 2, verse 10. Now, there was a verse I told you earlier. You should memorize this. Um, this is one of those verses you don't want to memorize, but you should memorize. Judges 2.10. After that whole generation, uh, Joshua's generation, after Joshua's generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. You know, this verse, I think, just shouts at us today. Uh, and it says this, that you and I, if you are a follower of Jesus, that we have to be intentional to pass the good news of who God is and what God has done to the next generation. But understand, it doesn't happen by accident. Like, you're going to have to be intentional in order to do this. Psalm 78 verse 4 says, We will not hide them from their descendants, but we will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, His power, and the wonders that He has done. But that's not what happened in the book of Judges. And the consequences were tragic. So I want to challenge you, uh, be intentional about living your faith, being a follower of Jesus, again, if that's, who, if, who, if that's who you are, but also challenge you to be intentional about passing your faith to the next generation. You should share your salvation story with them. Like, like your kids, your grandkids, they, they should be able to share your story of how you came to know Christ because they've heard it so many times. But not just your salvation story, they should also be able to know your life in Christ story. Not what God did for you one day, but what's God doing for you this day? 
you know, so many of us, and I'm probably top of the list. Man, we love sports, and we can tell you, you know, all the stats and all the figures. By the way, the Rays are going to have a faith day in a couple weeks, and we're going to go. Now, I don't know if they're going to have enough players to have a faith day. Everybody's sold off and traded off. But, but, I mean, the thought is, man, we love that. And yet, most of us say the greatest passion of our life is the Lord Jesus, Yet many of our family members, many of our spouses and our kids, those friends that we have around us, they wouldn't know that by following us. And that's what we have taken place in this tragic story that is before us. Judges 2.10, this haunting verse indeed that says that there was this great God-fearing, God-loving generation, but they die out. By the way, know this, scientifically proven, every generation is going to die out. Like, you're going to eventually die. And Joshua and Caleb, they died out. Their generation died out, and the next generation grew up. And they didn't know God, nor follow God. Now, some of you may not know Joshua's generation. They may go, well, I don't really know what's the big deal about them. Joshua and Caleb, like, they are the dynamic duo. Uh, they are unbelievable as two young men, the way they live their life of faith. They were great leaders, and they led God's people into the promised land that even Moses couldn't lead the people into. Joshua's generation saw miracle after miracle after miracle, and yet their kids, the very next generation, grew up not knowing or following God. There's a couple of things about Joshua and Joshua and Caleb that you need to know. First of all, they were focused. When, when God called Moses to deliver the children out of bondage, his chosen nation out of slavery, they send in the spies, 12 of them to be exact. And there was one from each tribe. And here's the only thing they were supposed to do. Just go into the land that God says, I'm promising to you. Like, I'm giving you this land. It's like this. Uh, many of you have watched some of the events of the Olympics already, but you knew what the result was going to be. Those are fun to watch, especially when we win. Like, when you know that we come in first, man, it's just fun. Fun to watch that. It's kind of what this was. God says, I want you guys to spy out the land. I'm going to give it to you, so don't worry about it. You're going to have victory in me, all right? But go spy out the land. Come back, tell everybody how great it is. So the 12 spies go in, and 10 of them come back and spread a bad report, a negative report in regard to the land. Only Joshua and Caleb said the land is flowing with milk and I mean, here are some of the produce from the land. It is unbelievable. So they were focused. Matter of fact, I would tell you they were faithful. So faithful were they that here's what God said. Every person 20 and older is going to pass away before I allow you to dwell in the land I've promised. Except for two people, Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb were able to live long enough to actually inhabit, to dwell, to, to go back to the land that they had visited as spies. Now, you have to think that when it got down to like the last three guys, man, Joshua and Caleb, you don't look good. Uh, I could take you out of your misery because once everyone died off, they got to go in. So they were faithful, and it seems like they finished. You know, it's one thing to start, something else to finish. You know, that's one thing in America, like if, if there was a gold medal for, fit, for starting, man, we're getting it. Uh, like we're great at starting. But the problem is you can't just start the race. You have to finish the race. You, you, you finish the race to win the prize of the high calling of Christ Jesus. And so it, it looks like they're going to finish well. But then again, we had that very sad verse that we had to read that there was a generation right after them that did not know. 
the Lord. Uh, there is this verse. Many of you have read it a lot. Uh, some of you have read it, even prayed it over your own families. Some of you may have had someone read this, pray this over you. Um, it, it's read a lot at weddings. It is found in Joshua 24, verse 14 and 15. I, I want you to see the words of Joshua himself. Right Now, you know the backstory. You know that right after he dies, that there's a generation that doesn't know God nor follow God. But I just told you a little bit about who they were, Joshua's generation. But I want you to hear from Joshua. Look what he says starting in verse 14. Now fear the Lord, serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your ancestors who they worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, this is the one that a lot of you have on a, on a mug or a bumper sticker. Or somebody gave you a picture when you got married, your aunt did, and, uh, and, and you put it in your closet somewhere. But look at verse 15. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, and choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your ancestors served, so he's saying the gods that, your, uh, uh, that the, the generation before us served beyond the Euphrates, or the gods of the Amorites, but those in whose lands we're living, uh, but look at this last sentence. But as for me, that's Joshua, as for me and my household, I love how he doesn't give them a vote. Right? He like pulls his kids over, his family over, says, listen, for me, and oh, wait, by my family, and you got to think, like every family has that one you know, child who's like, ah, I don't really know if I want to be counted in that vote. And then Joshua says, no, no, get over it. As for me and my household, here's what we're going to do. We're going to serve the Lord. Yet somehow, Joshua's generation, for all the good, and all the godly things they did, I'm convinced they didn't do the most important thing. They didn't pass their faith on. They somehow, somewhere, dropped the baton. Now, they said it, right? Joshua even calls everyone together, makes this amazing declaration. But I, I'm convinced... They spoke it, but they didn't share it. So it's one thing to say what you're going to do. It's one thing to have the family meeting. It's one thing to have the family prayer. It's the one thing to bring the family to church. But you're actually going to live it. And in living it, are you going to share it? Because you can say it, but everybody else is watching. So you can say it, but do they see it? And something happened. With Joshua and Caleb, two of my favorite people in all the Old Testament, they said it, but for some reason, their kids didn't see it. You know, again, the Olympics in Paris, it was a cool moment uh, as a soccer player uh, was uh, getting on the train, and that was kind of ironic since all the train stopped, the train had stopped. Uh, and couldn't go, and there were these three kids that came up, and he handed the Olympic torch to these three kids. And I thought, now that is a picture of the church. That's a picture of faith. One generation handing the torch of their faith to the next generation. They got that right. But you know, when it comes to the Olympics, there, there's this one race that we seem to never get right. It, it's the relay. There's something about, even though we will have some of the fastest runners in all the world, when they become part of that team, there's this moment where they have to exchange the baton. And so many times, what happens? We drop it. We drop the baton. And you know what? This is a stark reminder to me. That Christianity is only one generation away from being irrelevant. If we don't pass our faith to the next generation. So let me pause for a second. Now I get the privilege of speaking to the older generation this week. Chris is going to hang out speaking with the newer generation next week. 
But I want to say to the older generation, so many times, you know why we drop the baton? Because we want to hang on to it for so long that we run out of the window in which the baton is supposed to be passed. Because we don't think that next generation is capable of doing what we were able to do. And I'm going to tell you, that's a sad mistake that we make in the church. And we want to hang on and not trust the generation that the Lord has called to take the, the, the torch and to continue to run. And, and instead of letting go, we hang on. Instead of moving over to the side and going, hey, I'm going to... I'm going to have to slow down for a minute, <laughs> catch my breath for a moment, but I'm going to cheer you. I'm going to champion you to the finish line. Too many times, those of us in an older generation don't want to see the torch hand off to someone else, and we end up losing our race. And not only our race, we become disqualified from the race in general, and there's another generation that does not even have the baton to run with. So I would just challenge those of you of my generation. Hey, there's a moment we got to run in the same lane. Like we got to be in there together. Our hand is on the baton. Their hand is on the baton. But then there comes a moment we got to let go. You got to trust God and say, hey, hey, young fellow, go run. Go get it. I'm cheering for you, right? Isn't that what's so inspiring about the, the hall of faith in the Bible? You, we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. Here's what I'm convinced of and I'm concerned about. Why do we got to die and go to heaven before we become the cheerleader here on earth? Like, why does the great cloud of witnesses have to be in the sky? Why can't there be a great cloud of witnesses here going, I'm praying for you. I see God moving in your life. Call out what you see in the younger generation. You have such boldness. You have great faith. Man, I, I love what I'm hearing about you. Like, they need to hear that from us. Because if we drop the baton, Christianity isn't going to be important to a new generation coming up behind us. Now, Know this, this generation Joshua led into the promised land. They're the giant killer generation. I mean, these guys love God. They followed God. And unlike really the generation before them, their parents, their peers, man, they were not afraid to possess what God had promised to them, even though the the generation before said they were giants in the land. Numbers 13 gives us an amazing description of this. It tells of that previous generation. They stood on the doorstep of their destiny and never crossed over the threshold. They sent the spies in, as I told you, and as the spies came back, they told them all the challenges, all the obstacles. Matter of fact, they said this, we look like grasshoppers in their eyes. Like, that's how big they are. You know what I'm convinced? In a lot of churches, a lot of those in my generation and older, we still have grasshopper mentality. Like, we keep looking at the giants instead of looking at our God. We keep looking at all the challenges and all the obstacles instead of trusting God's truth that he has already called us to live in. So they shrunk back in fear. And again, 40 years later, Joshua and Caleb, they're leading this new generation of God's chosen people into God's chosen land. And they're, they're going to fight those same giants. Like they haven't left. And I love when finally they're the last person dies off. And Joshua, who's in charge, by the way, if you read numbers, you know who should have been in charge? Caleb. Caleb should have been in charge. Like, I mean, if you just read it from a resume standpoint, holy moly. Every time the people start grumbling and complaining about Moses' leadership, then to the point they're going to kill Moses in there. You know who always steps in? Caleb. Caleb always steps in. And you know what the people do? They don't do one thing. <laughs> there was something about Caleb that they're like, we don't want any part of him. Uh, Moses, we want some of. Aaron, we would like to go out back with. But Caleb, okay, we're good. And they would continue to go. So Joshua and Caleb, they're going to lead this generation in, in to fight the same giants. And when Joshua is divvying up the land, 
He doesn't give Caleb the land that God had promised. Now watch this. By the way, this is a great lesson for all of us to learn. You know what Caleb does? Caleb goes and he has coffee with some guys and he meets them at Buddy Brew and then he meets another group at Starbucks and they gossip. But they don't do that. You know what they do? Caleb gets a couple of guys. They go to Joshua and they say, Joshua, come on, what's up? And Caleb says, Joshua, you and I were there when God promised me that land and you're going to give me a different land? Like, Joshua, you can't do that. And Joshua's response was, Caleb, I don't know if you've looked in the mirror lately. (laughs) You and I aren't young anymore, man. Like, there's no way. That's the land where the greatest giants live. Caleb, there's no way. And Caleb's like, Joshua, that's none of your business. Like, you're supposed to give me that land. And here's what the Bible says. It's so cool. It only says this. So Joshua granted Caleb the land in which the giants lived. And there was no more war. I I wish there was more description of that. Like, what did Caleb do? Caleb goes in and takes out the giants, right? What if Joshua would have given that land to someone? We we don't know what could have happened. So there are these giants. And I believe what took place for Joshua and Caleb and their generation. They were so focused on the giants that they had seen that they forgot to equip and teach their kids about the giants that were not seen. Because there were these idols that crept in. There were this culture uh, that, that kept impressing upon them. And it was easy to recognize when they were facing the warrior giants, but now they're facing a different type of giant. And they didn't recognize that. And their kids were not prepared for that. Because the giants in which the next generation to follow Joshua and Caleb was even greater than the physical giants. These were giants that were trying to destroy and deconstruct their faith. And I really believe, I'm speaking to my group, my tribe, I really believe that Joshua's generation failed to train their children to be giant killers. I really believe that they just didn't see the need for their children to engage in the, in, the, in the fight in which they were engaged in. You know, I believe today um, that we stand at another critical, defying moment in our nation's history. I think we stand really at a spiritual crossroads. And there's no doubt that this generation is facing greater giants than most of us, especially those in my generation, ever fought before. And the enemy is determined to extinguish their faith. Without a doubt, that's happening. And if we don't do anything, that's exactly what's going to take place. And so that's why we have to be so concerned for the next generation That's why we have to invest in them, influence them. But the greatest thing is impact them. You know, as we close, and again, Chris is going to pick up next week. But as a pastor, if I could just share this with you as we close. One of my primary concerns as I look around our city, in our state, and in our country, is how badly generational transfer, especially in the church, has happened and really continues to happen. I think there's two reasons for that. Number one, we've devalued the older generation. My age and older, a lot of times they're devalued. And just know this, that is not a biblical worldview at all. Even in their last moments, elderly fathers and mothers were not seen as has-beens, but as essential in building up and empowering the next generation. They were called on to give and to pray blessings over the generation to come. And the second reason for such awkward generational transitions in the church is the reverse. And that is we've devalued the younger generation. You know, I have the privilege of uh, being at the University of Tampa, working with their baseball team a lot. And in those chapels, a lot of times, two of the same basic questions will come out. Uh, Now, not in large group, but one-on-one. Pastor JJ, um, could you help us to pray? 
Like there's some things going on. I don't even know how to talk to God about that. And then the other thing that I get asked a lot is, can you help, could you help me read the Bible? Like, it's such a big book. I don't even understand where to start. I don't know what to do. And, and, and could you help me with that? And, and a lot of times the older generation will look down and go, oh, how immature. Like how elementary. But isn't that the questions that Jesus' own disciples ask? Like, Lord, would you teach us to pray? God, would you teach us the value of your word and the words that have been before us? You know, those two questions are foundational. And the next generation, I'm convinced they want answers. But a lot of them did not have a mom or a dad of faith. A lot of them didn't have grandparents that were godly. And they're looking for mentors. But do you know how difficult that is? As a younger generation, especially for someone who was not born or raised here, maybe because of the military or their job or maybe their uh, uh, now wife or spouse lives, in, and they found themselves in Tampa, and they would love a mentor. But you remember, that's awkward. Like just to go up to someone, hey, um, you look pretty godly. Would you mentor me? Like That's a weird thing for them to do. It's kind of like asking someone to be their friend. And that's why, especially in our men's ministry, uh, I've developed this movement. It's, it's not a ministry, it's a movement where, where you can be invested by someone and you can also invest in someone else. Every single one of us, you need a Paul in your life, you need someone that can hand the baton to you, but then you need a Titus or a Timothy in your life, someone that you can hand the baton off to. So, so you got to receive it but you also have to give it. And guys, we'd love for you. Join the movement. Uh, become a part of the Titus 10. You know, many of you are, are young in your marriage. Uh, they did this dance-off last night. Uh, Sharon and I did not win. It wasn't because of our dancing skills. It was we had only been married 31 years. It was like laughable. Like, you guys get off the stage. Uh, I think a couple had been married a 54 years last night. And so after the dance-off... They asked that couple, hey, would you share some advice with this couple who've only been married for like an hour now? And you know what they did not do? They did not ask the couples who'd been married a year to give advice. They didn't even ask the couples who'd been married five years to give advice. They asked the couples who'd been married the longest, hey, would you give some advice? And some of you've been married a long time. Some of you've been married a short time. And we have a ministry, Pastor David, who led in communion overseas. It's marriage mentors, where you can, can have a couple in our church who will come alongside of you in your marriage, and, and they'll spend time with you. It's not Bible study. It, it's them sharing their life of marriage with you. Sometimes you guys go out to eat, depending on who your mentor is. Uh, but you can go out to eat together, spend time. We have that available for you. Why? Peter needed Cornelius. Paul needed Titus and Timothy and John Mark. I mean, man, even C.S. Lewis needed the Inklings. We need one another. Everyone needs someone in your life that has more stars, more stripes than you have. You need someone in your life that's already ran the part of the race that you're just now running. And a church that knows how to trust each generation is a church that knows how to trust in the faithfulness of God, that God will keep his promises. Psalm 33, 11, as we close. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Hey, question. Have you received faith? Like, have you received that? Have you received as a gift of God faith? And if you have received that, how are you running with it? And if you're running with faith, let me ask you a tougher question. How are you handing that off? Because you can't run a relay, and that's what the Christian faith is. It's a relay. You don't win the relay running all four stages. You only win the relay when you've received the baton and you've handed off the baton. It's generational ministry. Let's pray. Father, we want to get to a place where we value both old and young. 
But God, I believe that if that's to happen, it has to start the same way. God, we got to learn to say to each other, we see you, we hear you, we need you. God, I'm convinced that in that way, we can pass on this unfolding story of what you've done, that what you are doing and what you desire to do in the world in the following generations. So God, at the end of our days, Lord, help us to be able to rest assured that we didn't drop our baton and that we kept the story of faith moving along. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for the importance of passing our faith to the next generation. In Jesus' name we pray.